ventilators uh, and how to use them and how to get along with them pretty well. So I know that many of us in EMS are not super interested in using the vents and sometimes it's sometimes it's pretty cool uh, depending on how you've been trained but sometimes it can just be a tremendous pain in the butt uh, to set that thing up or maybe you've never used it before and you're not sure about it or somebody's told you it can be really bad. Uh, so I want to give you a framework to kind of get along with the ventilator. You may not have to like it all that much, but it is going to help your patient care. It is useful uh, and it can, uh, can save your butt sometimes. So it can be really difficult and the ventilator can seem kind of threatening, especially when you got a bunch of buttons that you've never messed with and, and aren't really sure what they go with. So yes, we should never expect to toss, uh, toss a ventilator like this out in front of you and just say, go do this uh, without a significant amount of training beforehand. So I want to give you a way to kind of coexist with the ventilator, uh, to get to know each other, to kind of become friends. Maybe eventually you start to like it. You invite it over for Thanksgiving or something like that. You get to know its family. Uh, and then you find out the ventilator's pretty nice guy, really. And uh, you'd like to like to have him. And you're, you're kind of sad that you ever didn't get along with him to start with. So... So EMS ventilators come in all shapes and sizes. Everything from really simple pneumatic powered ones uh, up at the top uh, that really just have some gears and some springs in them. Uh, then you get a little bit more complicated like with the auto vents and uh, the <clears throat> um, parapacks there, uh, but still not a whole lot of electronics to really do a lot of other functional stuff. And then you can get into the ones that are getting more advanced, like the uh, impacts of the Eagles and the Hamiltons and the Revelles, uh, the ones that are basically the same ventilator that you have in the hospital, but, uh, but portable. Um, all different shapes and sizes, but they all basically work the same way. However, I, th I think that sometimes a ventilator gets maligned for reasons that uh, aren't, aren't entirely true. The ventilator is not the thing that is, is really responsible if something bad happens. Again, you have to know the limitations of it. You know ha have to know how to use the thing. Um, and if, yes, if the sprocket breaks, then okay, it's the machine's fault. But otherwise, it's not the machine's fault that something bad happened. It's us not knowing how to use the vent uh, that, uh, that caused the bad outcome. And so we have to be mindful of that. Now that said, vents can do a much better job than most of us can in terms of oxygenation, ventilation, and uh, protecting people that uh, we're trying to do those things too. So <clears throat> um, remember, you have a responsibility when you start using a ventilator. It's not the vent's fault. You have to know how to use that thing, uh, what its limitations are, how to troubleshoot it, uh, and basically, again, be pretty good friends with it uh, and know it pretty well before you can safely use it. And you should use it. Let's take as an example uh, this. This is a simple pneumatic uh, ventilator. It's all mechanical. There's no batteries to it any place. If you hook it up to oxygen or compressed air, it will run. Um, <clears throat> it's got a way to change the amount of air that you push through it. And then it's got a way to change how frequently it pushes air. And that's pretty much it. And this is the guts. This is the heart of most ventilators. Ventilators are basically uh, pumps. They push air and then they stop and let air come back out of whatever they just pushed it into. And that's the, that's the heart of pretty much every ventilator. If you're going to use a ventilator, you got to know what ventilator you're using and you got to know the limitations behind it, as I kind of mentioned before. Uh, so we're going to hit on that for this first little bit real quick. One of the things we don't think about very often is that part of this ventilator circuit is the patient. We always think of the tubing and like the ventilator itself and maybe the, the like HME valve uh, thing on it and the like exhalation filter and all that kind of stuff. We think of that as like the vent, but 50% of what goes of, you know, what goes on with the uh, ventilator is a result of the patient himself. So some stuff you got to know about the patient. It's not acceptable to pick up a patient on a ventilator, take him to another hospital and never know why he got intubated. Was it because he was hypoxic? Was it because he uh, was not ventilating well enough and his CO2 was super high? Or was it because he wasn't protecting his airway? Or was it because he was a jerk and you didn't like him and you needed some way to get him through a CT scan uh, and so we decided to put him down and intubate him or something like that? All these are possibilities. It is important for you when you pick up a patient to know why he got uh, intubated and why he's on the vent. It's important to know when did he get intubated. Did this just happen a few minutes ago, like right before we got here and we're gonna have to sort out all these uh, problems that happen right after you put somebody on a vent? Or has he been stable like this for six hours or six days? Uh, when did he actually get intubated and why? Super big questions. When he got intubated, what meds did he get? And what we usually are talking about there is did he get just sedative medicines or paralytic medicines, uh, and has he gotten anything since then? 
And of course, the reason for that will become clear in just a second, but you have to figure out uh, what meds did he get and then when did he get them so that you know when they're gonna wear off. And then the last question that's really important that we tend to not ask is what problems have you had with him since he's been on a ventilator? Uh, have you had a hard time oxygenating? Does he buck a lot? Does he seem better on one setting versus another setting? And the reason for that is if the sending facility, uh, assuming that you are doing a transfer, if the sending facility has figured out a solution to whatever problem it was they had with him, then you may want to take that to heart and not try to reinvent the wheel because he will probably still have that same problem if uh, you make the same mistake that they did. One of the key questions that we're gonna have to ask is how am I gonna keep this guy asleep? So we've all seen somebody that in the uh, bed at the sending ED looked calm and cool and no problem. And then we got him into the ambulance, still okay. We pulled out of the parking lot of the hospital and we're about a mile down the road. Uh, and all of a sudden this guy wakes up and decides he doesn't wanna be intubated anymore and doesn't like being in this bed or in this ambulance. And so when folks wake up, that's a really dangerous time to be in the back of an ambulance with an intubated patient. Uh, and hopefully you've got two people, but I've certainly seen it done with one person in the back of an ambulance with an intubated patient who then uh, wakes up and starts causing problems. So to my mind, if we're gonna transport this guy, I basically want him in hypersleep uh, while, we're, while we're going there. I don't want him to know that he's left the hospital. I don't want him to know that he's intubated. I want him in dreamland the entire time because there's really nothing about uh, his condition that is gonna change the fact that I'd like him to stay intubated throughout the transport. We are going from hospital A to hospital B and nothing is gonna change that. One way or another, he's still gotta to get to hospital B. And whether or not his mental status is okay or whatever his uh, you know, neuro check is during that time, again, to me is sort of secondary to let's get the guy there safely. And I think that's an important point. Yeah, it's nice if you can keep them at a RASA minus two and everything goes great, but uh, the lighter the person gets, uh, the harder it's gonna be to keep him down when he gets uh, awoke and you start going over a bumpy road. So uh, if, if it's up to me, I'm gonna say, put these guys down, let them sleep. Uh, the, uh, the receiving hospital can wake him up and uh, do whatever they need to do. But for us, we just need to get him there safely. And part of that is keeping the guy down. So, to me, it is not okay. Oh, his blood pressure was a little low when we uh, gave him some fentanyl, so we didn't give him any more fentanyl. So the guy's been sitting there writhing for the last uh, 45 minutes with this tube in his throat, uh, literally crying. That's not an okay thing to do. If he needs blood, per or if he needs um, uh, something to resuscitate him after you give him the pain medicine uh, because his blood pressure is low, then give him that thing. Is it fluids because he's septic? Is it uh, blood because he's bleeding someplace? Do you need to relieve his tension pneumothorax? Does he need to be on pressures? Whatever it is, do that. Uh, fix the thing, resuscitate the patient, uh, and don't rely on his endogenous catecholamines, which are only going to last so long uh, in order to keep his blood pressure up. If his blood pressure drops, figure out why his blood pressure dropped and fix that, and give him the pain medicine. Keep him comfortable, because if he pulls that tube out, then you're going to have a whole other world of problems. Uh, likewise, rocuronium is not a sedative. It's not okay to just kit, put this guy down uh, without giving him any sort of analgesia or sedation to go along with it. I know it happens sometimes in a well-meeting uh, way in that we ran out of all the other sedatives we have and in order to keep him safe, we went ahead and paralyzed him. Uh, <clears throat> but I've also seen it done uh, as frequently, probably, in saying the well, he was drunk and so we didn't give him any uh, sedatives. We figured he was already sedated. That's, that's not cool. Uh, now the guy's been rocked for uh, an hour or so. And when they wake up, they remember a lot of that. And uh, that's not good. So um, rocuronium is not a sedative. Uh, and pain and terror are not vasopressors. Treat their pain. Uh, get, them, uh, get them some sedation. What kind of sedatives are you going to use? Well, it's up to you and your protocols and your service, of course. A lot of us are going to reach for propofol to start off with because we know about it and we know that it's uh, quick on, quick off, and we can give a bunch of it, maybe cause a little bit of hypotension, but for the most part, we're pretty comfortable with propofol. Uh, if you are going to give propofol, and it's, it's not a bad choice, what I would say is I would lean real heavily first on some sort of pain medicine. So propofol has no analgesic property to it. It makes you sleep, but it doesn't relieve any of the pain, any of the uh, reasons that you might wake up. 
Things like fentanyl work really well for this. So I would lean really heavily first on giving the guy a big slug of fentanyl. And I'm talking like 100 mics at a time because what's the worst thing that's gonna happen uh, if you give somebody a little bit too much fentanyl while he's intubated? He's gonna stay asleep. You're, you fix the respiratory part because he's on a ventilator and he's intubated. You've uh, secured his airway. All the bad stuff that happens with the opiates uh, is not gonna happen because you've already got a tube in his throat. So give him a big slug of medicine. Don't worry about it being a little bit too much. Uh, it'll go away. Uh, the big thing is keep him safe and a, uh, a strategy of high doses of pain medicine with just a little bit of sedative to keep him uh, quiet is a pretty solid strategy usually and works out pretty well for both you and for the patient. So lean heavily on the fentanyl uh, or for that matter Dilaudid or whatever it is you've got ketamine. Uh, lean heavily on that and a little bit less on either the benzos or on the propofol. And then always have a plan B for how you're going to keep this guy down if he starts to get rowdy in the ambulance because it's going to happen at some point. Uh, so you better make sure it's not okay to go with just like uh, two milligrams of Versed sitting in your back pocket or something like that. You're going to need more. So have a plan B. How are we going to get this guy sedated if the propofol runs out? Uh, or if I give him my 100 mics, 200 mics of fentanyl that I've got here, what's going to be my next step? Have something else ready to go. Have another bottle of propofol or another uh, drug kit ready with you uh, because if you get 45 minutes down the road and you've still got 20 minutes to go and the guy's a wild man, uh, that's dangerous for you and dangerous for him. So have a plan B uh, on your sedation and think ahead ahead of times. All right, so we talked about the patient. Now let's talk about the ventilator. Uh, so most ventilators, again, if they're really complicated, they can look something like this, although it's sort of like looking at the cockpit of a plane. Once you sort of figure out what each individual button does, it's really not all that complicated anymore and it's not nearly as frightening to, to look at as you might have thought. You can sort of boil down most ventilator faceplates into something like this. Uh, and it still has a few knobs on it, but it may become even a little bit easier if you can say, well, what do each of these knobs actually control in terms of what do they do for a patient? So if instead of saying like worrying about the mode, you figure out why the patient is intubated and then you can switch the indication on it. Or if instead of worrying that much about respiratory rate, you think, okay, well, what's that gonna change? It's end tidal. Uh, then that's the thing that respiratory drives, then it becomes a little bit easier to sort of think of. So think of each of these knobs as not so much controlling maybe a thing on the vent if you want, but think of it as changing a setting for the patient or what the patient is doing, and then you can monitor that setting. So let's go through each of these real quick. <clears throat> Ventilator mode uh, itself. The simplest mode of ventilation, the, the mode is the way that the ventilator sort of uh, understands to give breaths and to let breaths uh, come back out after that. So the, e the most simple form of ventilation is a ventilator that goes every six seconds, I'm going to give a breath uh, of 500 uh, mLs. That's called continuous mandatory ventilation. It's a, a set uh, rate uh, at which the patient is gonna get breaths and you're not gonna get any breaths in otherwise. So if the patient has an ET tube that's occluding their airway and you put them on CMV, then that patient is gonna get a breath every you know, set amount of time, every six seconds, let's say. Uh, if he tries to take a breath in the meantime, the ventilator will not let that breath go through most of the time. So you can understand where if the patient still has some spontaneous respiratory effort and doesn't want to breathe only every six seconds, uh, but maybe wants to take a breath at 5.5 seconds, that can be a little distressing for the patient. So you don't see a lot of CMV used with uh, most ventilators anymore. You might see this on like a CPR vent uh, that's gonna give 500 mLs, uh, again, every six seconds, somebody w where there is absolutely no chance that they have spontaneous respirations. But otherwise, we've gone to uh, better things that work with the patient a little bit better. Um, there's sort of four basic ways that the ventilator decides uh, how to give a breath and, and what triggers it to give a breath. So you need to make a choice on two different parameters, uh, either AC or SIMV, uh, and then volume control versus pressure control. And we'll set up a matrix to figure out what, what that's all talking about in a minute. Um, but let's hit each of these real quick. Assist control means that uh, the ventilator is gonna give a breath every set amount of time. You know, again, every six seconds or so. Um, but if the patient in the interim tries to take a breath on his own, the ventilator will sense that and when it senses the patient has taken a breath, it will give the patient a full breath along with it. 
So every time the patient tries to take a little breath, the ventilator senses that and says, oh, this guy's trying to breathe, give him a breath, uh, it will give a full tidal volume breath along with it. So if the patient does not breathe at all, then that's okay. The ventilator is still gonna give him a breath every, you know, again, say whatever the rate is, six seconds or so. But if he tries to take a breath at three seconds, the ventilator is gonna go ahead and give him a breath. So this is good for uh, patients who are still trying to breathe on their own, but maybe they're getting tired because they had a COPD exacerbation or uh, something like that. Um, this, can, this helps you to take big breaths in. Synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation, or SIMV, uh, <clears throat> is a little bit different, but still based on the same basic principle. So the ventilator is going to give, uh, basically going to give a breath at whatever rate uh, the, the operator sets it as. So let's say he gets a breath, we're going to tell him to give a breath every six seconds or so. In SIMV, if the patient tries to breathe on his own though, the ventilator will sense that and it will open a valve and let the patient take whatever breath he wants in the meantime. It won't give him a breath, so the patient may take just a little tiny breath with it, uh, <clears throat> but the ventilator won't help him with that breath, it'll just allow him to breathe through it. So again, uh, if he is going to, uh, if he is not breathing at all, then the ventilator is going to give him a set tidal volume or set pressure at a set interval every six seconds or so. But if you try to take a breath immediately after that, the ventilator will just open uh, the valve and let you take whatever size breath you want without giving you a lot of support with it. And then it does some math and tries to make sure that you're getting the, the appropriate minute volume so that you're not, uh, you know, not taking a bunch of little tiny breaths with no support. And if it needs to give you another breath, it will give you another breath. Uh, but that's the big difference between assist control and SIMV. In assist control, every time you try to take a breath, the ventilator is going to give a full volume breath. Uh, in SIMV, every time you try to take a breath, the ventilator is just going to say, go ahead and let you take in whatever air you want. But either way, in the end, if you're not taking a breath, the ventilator will give you the breath at whatever rate uh, you've preset the thing to do it at. So. The next thing to talk about is uh, volume control versus pressure control, the second thing that you have to kind of determine when you're setting the, the mode of ventilation. Volume control and pressure control are uh, how big a breath the ventilator gives and what the ventilator uses to determine about how, to big, how big a breath to give. So volume control is easy to set. You set how much volume you want the ventilator to push through. If it's 450 mLs, you set it to 450 mLs, and every uh, every time the ventilator gives a breath, it's going to push 450 mLs uh, out through the uh, through the port. Uh, that's pretty easy to set. Pressure control is a uh, a little bit different in that it tells the ventilator uh, you set an amount of pressure that you want the ventilator to push and the ventilator will push until it reaches that set of pressure, until it's put enough air out that it reaches that pressure limit uh, in the chest or in the airway or in the tube or whatever it's hooked up to. It will push until it reaches that pressure limit and then it will cut off. So instead of setting a volume, you tell it, I'm gonna set a pip of uh, you know 20 or something like that. So it's gonna push uh, until it reaches that pressure of 20 and then it's gonna cut off. And if you got 300 milliliters as your tidal volume, as your breath, uh, then okay, that's what you got. If you got 600 uh, before it reached that pressure, then that's what you got. What does it really matter all that much? Well, volume control is pretty easy to set. You turn it, you dial it up, and, uh, and then you're done. Uh, pressure control is probably a little bit, has probably a little bit less work of breathing for the patient and maybe a little bit more comfortable for the patient. Although, uh, again, most of the guys that we're going to deal with are probably going to be fairly he heavily sedated. Pressure control, though, can uh, be harder to set and it's easier to screw it up. It's hard to screw up volume control. You just tell it what pressure or what uh, volume you want, uh, and then it does its thing. Pressure control, you've got to watch it pretty closely. Pressure control can also change um, from breath to breath and from uh, moment to moment, well, not moment to moment, but over the course of several minutes. Uh, you could have set somebody so that they're getting tidal volumes of 450 uh, milliliters with each breath, and something changes, and now the patient's getting 250 milliliters with each breath. So pressure control, Control is probably a little bit better for the patient, maybe, uh, but easier to screw up. 
There's also these other things like pressure regulated volume control that kind of takes both of those things where you set, uh, as the operator, you set an amount that you want the patient to get. You want him to get 450 milliliters of volume with each breath. And then the ventilator uh, sort of messes with how fast it gives that breath uh, and changes it around to keep the pressure within a, a set parameter as well. So you get sort of the good things about the pressure, uh, pressure control, but you get the good tidal volumes that you set with volume control. So PRVC, uh, it's a computerized mode of ventilation, so you can't use it on like a little pneumatic vent or something like that, of course. Uh, in the end, it really doesn't matter that much what mode you set. Um, <clears throat> for a lot of these patients. Now up in the ICU after a long period of time, yeah, it probably makes a, a big difference um, for a lot of these guys. But for us, for the most part, it doesn't matter all that much. What I would encourage you to do is if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with ventilators, as most of us probably are for the most part, pick something that you know. And that's probably gonna be assist control, volume control. Meaning that every time the patient takes a breath, uh, he's gonna get a, a supported breath from the ventilator itself. And we are gonna determine how much volume goes in with a knob. And we're just gonna set whatever volume we want. We're gonna set it to 450 or 500 or whatever it is. And then the ventilator is gonna give that much volume with each breath. And then we'll just watch uh, to make sure he doesn't uh, go over on pressure. But in the end, there's really not great evidence to say one way or the other that any of the other modes of ventilation are superior in terms of patient outcomes. You can also switch from one to the other. Uh, if the patient seems to be taking lots of, trying to take lots of fast breaths and they keep getting these full tidal volume things, maybe they don't need that. Maybe they uh, need to go on SIMV so they can take little breaths in the meantime. You can make those changes and see if the patient is more comfortable or appears more comfortable, breathes more easily uh, using a different mode of ventilation. There's also these more esoteric, more advanced modes of ventilation like airway pressure release ventilation you might see or, or bivent they, they were calling it where the, the ventilator basically gives you this big breath and then holds it, holds it, holds it, holds it, holds it, lets it go, another big breath kind of right away and it looks like That can be good for things uh, like bad ARDS or if you have a lot of fluid in your lungs or something like that. Um, but most of us aren't going to get into that with most of the ventilators that we're going to be using um, in, the, in the transport environment or in the EMS environment. So that's mode.